Adobe is bringing generative fill to video, Google is protecting its AI workplace users, and much, much more. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes. We kick off today with a very exciting feature that was just premiered at an Adobe event this week. Of course, at this stage, some of the most exciting advancements in the AI space this year have been around text image generation. We've seen increasingly advanced models, Dolly 3 integrated into ChatGPT, and of course, we've had features like Adobe's Generative Fill, which give creators more control than ever before. Generative Fill is a feature in which you can select a very specific part of an image and change it using the same sort of natural language inputs and prompting that you would create a whole image from the ground up with. Now, this feature is no longer just a part of Adobe. You see something similar in Canvas, Midjourney has adapted it as well. But at this week's Adobe Max event, they actually premiered something they're calling Fast Fill, which is the same type of feature, but for video. So in the example video they showed, they had a small clip of a man in a suit walking through a city scene and were able to select and change his tie from not having any tie to having a blue tie to having a different color tie. And again, this wasn't just a static image, but a moving video. Another example they gave was taking a group of background joggers out of a video whose subject was a woman in the foreground. Now, unlike some of the other things that Adobe has recently announced, like their Image Model 2 earlier this week, this is unfortunately still very much in the experimental category. Users can't get their hands on this service just yet. But it shows how quickly the text-to-image capacities that we're quickly getting used to and developing new workflows around are also coming to video. The average response I saw on Twitter slash X were phrases like, next level, and holy moly. Now, speaking of the world of images and video, outside of features, a lot of the discussion recently has been around copyright claims. Of course, the data used to train different models has remained largely a black box, and there are several lawsuits going on across a variety of different services from image creation tools to things like ChatGPT, where content creators and copyright owners are claiming that the use of their works to train AI models somehow violates their copyright. Now, this is a fairly important issue because one of the big areas of potential adoption for AI is, of course, in the enterprise. However, legal and compliance departments have a strong issue with using tools that potentially open companies up to lawsuits. There are a number of different ways that companies are trying to address that. One of them is training models on proprietary data sets. Getty Images has done this in the image space, and Adobe's Image 2 model also promises to be only trained on the set of stock images that they actually own the copyrights to. That's sort of step one in making them a little bit more safe for enterprise use. Step two, however, is taking the proactive step of guaranteeing that if a user finds itself in a lawsuit based on those copyright claims, that the company will take on their legal defense. Adobe was first to market with that pledge earlier this year and was followed quickly by Microsoft doing something similar. And now Google has followed them, pledging to defend people who are using their generative AI tools in workspace against this sort of copyright claim. Now, so far, it appears that Google's indemnity program focuses on their Vertex AI development platform and their Duet AI system, which generate text and images in Google Workspace and other cloud programs. Their press release didn't mention the better-known generative program BARD, but it wouldn't be surprising to see that as well. To me, this just underscores that the AI market is so valuable right now that even in this time of a lack of clarity around things like copyright, the big tech competitors are willing to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to legal defense just to try to continue to move people onto their platforms. Speaking of Google and speaking of that AI arms race, now that both ChatGPT and Bing have integrated image generation, Google Search Generative Experience, or SGE, is getting a similar capability. It's a great example of how something that didn't exist a couple months ago has now become absolute table stakes for people who are in this space. Now, on this theme of enterprise use cases, Gartner has just put out a new report that suggests major, major growth in enterprise use of AI over the next few years. Right now, Gartner says that around 5% of enterprises are formally using AI tools. In other words, they've made it a specific initiative or they've done some specific procurement process. That's, of course, different than just individual employees of companies who are using those tools, where the percentages would be much higher. However, according to this report, they anticipate that by 2026, a full 80% of enterprises will actually be using things like AI APIs or even spinning up their own models. Over in the world of policy... Even as some number of senators and congresspeople are working on comprehensive AI legislation, we're also seeing an increasing number of specific discrete AI-related acts that try to address or create rules around some specific issue. A great example of this is a new proposed rule called the No Fakes Act. Now, technically, this is called the Nurture Originals Foster Art and Keep Entertainment Safe Act of 2023, but of course, this being Congress, it has to be a cute acronym, No Fakes. The bill prevents the, quote, production of a digital replica without consent of the applicable individual or rights holder. 
And basically what this is going for is that if an artist or a musician comes across someone who's creating a digital artificial facsimile of them, such as, for example, using an artist's voice for an unauthorized song, this bill would give that artist civil recourse. Now, one of the reasons that they've focused on this right now is that a lot of the likeness laws which might be extended to cover AI-generated versions are sort of state-by-state state and fragmented. This would effectively federalize those laws, which obviously makes it much easier to enforce. The Recording Industry Association of America, who we talked about yesterday as trying to get a voice cloning site on a privacy watch list in the U.S., said that they welcomed the bill. Others, however, worry about rushing in too fast. Dwayne Morris partner Jeremy Ellman said, Regulating AI is certainly at the top of the list for lawmakers these days, but they should be careful not to rush into creating a new federal IP rights that may conflict with longstanding balances in the IP system. Moving to our next topic, we've talked a lot about how assertive the U.S. military establishment is being in adopting new AI tools, and in particular in building their own. One interesting story then is that the U.S. Space Force has paused the use of all AI tools, including ChatGPT, because of concerns around data security. Reuters got access to a September 29th memo addressed to all Space Force employees that prohibits them from using these types of tools on government computers unless they receive formal approval. The ban was said to be temporary and was, quote, due to data aggregation risks. And of course, this is the type of thing we've seen from a lot of private companies as well who are concerned with data leakage and the foundation model companies accidentally getting access to really proprietary and sensitive data, which of course, when you're dealing with military applications, is an even more heightened concern. Now, it's probably notable that we're also getting lots of information about, for example, the U.S. intelligence establishment training their own foundation models, which obviously are going to come with a higher degree of control than they would just tapping into something like ChatGPT. And lastly today, one follow-up from our story yesterday about character AI. As I mentioned, I don't feel like I have a lot of visibility into who's using it, and so because of that, I'm actually paying even more attention to trying to understand who is using it, and how, and what the implications might be. Well, right after I published that episode, Going Godward on Twitter wrote, Y'all, oh my word, it's bleak. My students are becoming addicted to character AI and are abandoning real-life interactions and friendships for conversation and pseudo-relationships with AI. I can see how social media has been the gateway to fully integrating the real with the transhuman. These children began interacting with AI from a young age, so it feels natural for them to experience AI as the friend they've always wanted. It's much more exciting and much easier to be friends with AI LeBron James than to develop the kind of character that makes you more real and more into the kind of person who's a good friend. Every new AI technology seems to make us more like a machine and less like ourselves. Too many negative consequences to name. Now, of course, I know nothing about this user. I don't know what they actually do. This could be entirely a fake post. And even if not, there's always going to be this type of response to the advent of a new technology. Previous generations almost see what is lost more than what is gained when it comes to a fundamentally new behavior pattern. That said, it's not hard to imagine how this could really ring true, especially among young people whose social systems are just still forming. And so I share it with you as one piece of evidence of the ongoing changes around us wrought by generative AI. Make of that what you will. That will do it for today's AI Breakdown Brief. Thanks as always for listening or watching, and I'll be back soon with the main AI Breakdown.